nights out. The Sabbath is the day to rest physically and spiritually, mentally. And uh, smoking is definitely resting the Sabbath. He's definitely having a good Sabbath here. Can you purr for me this morning? Or you can purr your throat. He's purring, but it's not coming out. This song is called Don't Forget the Sabbath. Don't forget the Sabbath the Lord our God hath blessed. Of all the weak, the brightest, of all the weak, the best. It brings repose from labor, it tells of joy divine. Its beams of light descending in heavenly beauty shine. Welcome, welcome, ever welcome, blessed Sabbath day. Welcome, welcome, ever welcome, blessed Sabbath day. Keep the Sabbath holy and worship him today, who said to his disciples, I am the living way. And if we meekly follow our Savior here below, He'll give us of the fountain, which whose streams eternal flow. Welcome, welcome, ever welcome, blessed Sabbath day. Welcome, welcome, ever welcome, blessed Sabbath day. Day of sacred pleasure, its golden hours we'll spend in thankful hymns to Jesus, the children's dearest friend. O oh, gentle, loving Savior, how good and kind thou art! How precious is thy promise to dwell in every heart! Welcome, welcome, ever welcome, blessed Sabbath day. Welcome, welcome, ever welcome, blessed Sabbath day. There was a family that was observing beavers and <clears throat> they noticed that for six days, the beaver, beavers would work hard at maintaining and repairing their dams and gathering uh, food to eat, and they're busy chewing trees down. But on the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, the beavers were mainly just in their dens, and they weren't out cutting trees down, they weren't repairing their dams, they were just resting. And uh, <clears throat> other people noticed with their honeybees that they're really, really active and really, really busy for six days, but on the seventh day, they're just coming in and out a lot more slowly and not so much activity. So we live in a world with a lot of sin and that animal kingdom does not always reflect God's principles. Um, it's so sad to see like um, a lion going after an antelope and the killing and the blood and that wasn't God's original intention. But even after 6,000 years of sin, we can still see some of the animal kingdom reflecting what God originally intended. For his creation. All right, let's begin our study with prayer. 
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Sabbath day, for a day to rest, a day to spend with you. We're asking as we open your word that you will teach us, you will strengthen us to apply the principles that we find into our own lives. We ask that you will bind Satan and his evil angels that this message can go home to our hearts. And we ask also that you would bless those here and those that will watch later. And we thank you and we're asking in the name of your son, Jesus, Yeshua. Amen. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Isaiah 42 and verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to to graven images, Isaiah 42, verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images, Isaiah 42, verse 8. All right, Stephanie, are you ready? I'll give it a try. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Isaiah 42, verse 8. Excellent. Go, Stephanie. We are on day two, page 140 in our curriculum book. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 12 through 22. And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army, and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent, and with earth upon his head. And when he came, lo, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside, watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city, he told it, and all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was ninety and eight years old, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I and he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. 
And he said, What is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people, and thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass, when he made mention of the ark of God, that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck brake, and he died. For he was an old man and heavy, and he had judged Israel forty years. And his daughter-in-law, Phineas's wife, was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself in travail, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel. Because the ark of God was taken, and because her father-in-law and her husband. Wow, how would you like to be named? How would you like for your name to mean the glory is departed? Ichabod. Wow. Verse 22, And she said, The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. The most terrible thing that could happen to Israel occurred. The ark had been captured and was in possession of the enemy. The glory had indeed departed from Israel when the symbol of the abiding presence and power of Jehovah was removed from the midst of them. With this sacred chest were associated the most wonderful revelations of God's truth and power. In former days, miraculous victories had been achieved wherever it appeared. It was shadowed by the wings of the golden cherubim and the unspeakable glory of the Shekinah, the visible symbol of the Most High God, had rested over it in the Holy of Holies. But now it had brought no victory. It had not proved a defense on this occasion, and there was mourning throughout Israel. The law of God contained in the ark was also a symbol of his presence. Israel had not honored the law by obeying it. Therefore they were defeated in battle and lost the precious ark. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 9 says, he that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. When the army went out to battle, Eli, blind and old, had tarried at Shiloh. It was with troubled forebodings that he awaited the result of the conflict, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. Taking his position outside the gate of the tabernacle, he sat by the highway side day after day, anxiously expecting the arrival of a messenger from the battlefield. At length a Benjamin at length and Benjamin stumbling over this. At length a Benjamin knight, or in other words, someone from the tribe of Benjamin. A Benjamin a Benjamin knight from the army, with his clothes rent, and with earth upon his head, came hurrying up the ascent, leading to the city. Passing heedlessly the aged man beside the way, he rushed 
on to the town, and repeated to eager throngs the tidings of defeat and loss. The sound of wailing and lamentation reached the watcher beside the tabernacle. The messenger was brought to him, and the man said unto Eli, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people, and thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. Eli could endure all this, terrible as it was, for he had expected it. But when the messenger added, and the ark of God is taken, a look of unutterable anguish passed over his countenance. The thought that his sin had thus dishonored God and caused him to withdraw his presence from Israel was more than he could bear. His strength was gone, he fell, and his neck brake, and he died. We have some review questions. What happened on the battlefield? They took the ark and didn't help them, and so they lost the battle, and several people died, including Hophni and Phineas, mm. and the ark was taken. Mm. Yes. I don't remember the number of people that died. I thought I remember 30,000 for some I reason. believe 30,000 is correct, yes. Yes, I think I remember that as well. How did Eli end up dying? He heard the news and he was not surprised by most of it. But then when he heard that the ark of God was taken, then he fell backwards and broke his neck and died. Mm, wow. So I wonder if in this moment he was... I wonder if he asked for forgiveness in this moment. Mm. Because I'm wondering if he had let his sons do all these things all the time and not stood up for the Lord. Would it really bother him that his sin had caused this? Or was this a possibility that he was truly repenting? That's a good question. I... Or does it say anything more in the Bible about him, or is this just for me? This is all that I <clears throat> know of that is ever mentioned. I don't get the impression that his repentance was real mm -hmm. and deep. Um, he was sorry for the outcome and distressed for what had taken place, but... He wasn't truly sorry for allowing all of this to happen. But, I, you know, I don't know the heart. And we know that the thief on the cross repented at the very last minute. And mm -hmm. so I would hope that in this last time of Eli's life that he did truly truly take responsibility for where he had failed in his sons and truly ask for forgiveness. Um, well, we don't really know the condition of his heart, but we do know that our Heavenly Father is the fair judge. And he knows the heart. We leave that to him. The new little kitty is coming out to see hey. us. Cool. Hello, kitty. Oh, he went off. Oh, I guess it's actually not cool. Bill named her Oreo. Oh. Because she's marked a little bit like Oreo. Uh, 
she showed up in the barn yesterday evening. And she's meow, meow. She was really scared of me, but she did let me pick her up. So I brought her inside here and gave her some food. And at first she was so scared that she just curled up in this little box that had a container of salt in it. And it was this little narrow spot and she just stayed right there. But now she's feeling a little bit more comfortable with moving around, but poor thing, she got scared and knocked her head on the corner there mm -hmm. as she ran. Oh, I don't think she was visible on camera when she came out. Mm -hmm. Maybe she'll get bolder and, and one of these days she'll join us for a Bible study. Mm -hmm. So the lesson here doesn't go into the rest of our reading about his friends, his wife. That was with child, and it's such a horrible thing that all these people and their family died as a result of Eli's not putting stop to his sons, his idolatry and adultery and all this other mm -hmm. stuff. Mm. And then now his grandson had to grow up without either of his parents. Mm. Wow. Poor Ichabod, no mother, no father. I'm sure there was other family to raise him, but um, and if Eli would have said no, you're not taking the ark of God out of the tabernacle. We've not had any direction from the Lord that that's what we need to do, so we're not doing we're not doing that without counsel and direction from the Lord. It sounds like Ichabod's mother would have lived, <clears throat> but it was she was sad that her father-in-law died. She was sad that her husband died, but when she heard that the Ark was captured by the Philistines, then she felt like God's glory is gone. That it's no more. Like the we have no hope. And just in that hopelessness and in that deep distress, she died. Um, this shows how <clears throat> strong an impact our emotions have upon our physical body. We need the gift of the Holy Spirit. We need to empty ourselves of sin and doubt so that we can receive this gift of the Holy Spirit. And then when we receive this gift of the Holy Spirit, one of the gifts, one of the things that the Holy Spirit does in us is produce faith. And then when we have faith, we can see beyond our present trouble to what God has promised and the good things that are in front of us that are in the future. And faith can keep us from emotionally becoming so distressed that physically we get damaged or die. One thing that I thought was shocking was that in verse 20, it says that they told her, Fear not, for thou hast born a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. I just can't even imagine. So rather than being excited, like, oh, wow, I have a son. She didn't respond to that. Like her mind was so focused on the ark has been taken, the glory of the Lord has departed, my husband's dead, my father in law is dead. She couldn't appreciate the beautiful gift that God had given her in the moment because she was thinking about this other disaster and, and bad news. So let's learn. A lesson from this story. In the moment, she had something to thank the Lord for. And like, wow, thank you, Lord, for this gift. There was news that was far away from her that wasn't directly affecting her at that time. And she allowed the, the news 
of something far away from her to impact her more greatly than the huge blessing that God had given her in the moment. There may be news that you receive from far away that may not directly affect you in your present reality. This affected her indirectly, but this was far away. The fighting was far away. Philistines were far away. She wasn't directly going to be hauled away as a captive or made a slave, even though the Israelites had lost. That wasn't directly affecting her at that time. But thinking about the possibility of that, thinking about that, what was far away from her, kept her from being able to appreciate and thank the Lord for the amazing gift that he had given her right there in the moment. So if we have amazing blessings that the Lord has given us right here in the moment, let's thank him for that. And then that will help us. And let's recognize those things, thank the Lord for them. And then that will help us not to be so broken to pieces by a situation that may be farther removed from us. I'm sure she also had other children too, I would, I would assume. Unless this was the firstborn, I don't know. Probably she did. I assume she would have been married to him for a long time and that she wouldn't have married him when he was sleeping with other women and all this other stuff. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe at first they were kind of behaving better at first. And then later, as they became comfortable in their position, they started to slide into sin. That's probably how it was. I would, I would imagine, because I, I don't, I don't think she would be interested in marrying him while he was doing what he was doing with all the women, and it was well known <clears throat> what they were doing. So I would say all these things happen. But also, she was already emotionally torn up and been going through years of this mm -hmm. nightmare. Mm -hmm. And so, this was just like the thing that just took her out because, mm -hmm. I guess because she wasn't surrendering it to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Because it's when there's something like that, it's really, really hard to deal with. Mm -hmm. And it does emotionally like make you sick and mm -hmm. make you not function and really affects you. Mm -hmm. So I can understand how even if she wasn't pregnant and hadn't gone into labor, I could see how those events happen and could just make her have a heart attack or something. Yes, yes. And so I can't even imagine making, <laughs> like hearing that news and making you go into labor and then going through labor, and then like you're just completely exhausted and just. Mm -hmm. And we look at the Apostle Paul, and he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Therefore, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give me on that day, and not to me only but to all those also who, who love his appearing. The Apostle Paul said, I'm, I'm ready to die. I'm, I'm ready to be offered. His conscience was clear. His heart was right with the Lord. He had fulfilled the purpose and the work that God had given him to do. And so the Apostle Paul was ready to face death. But Phineas Hophni and Phineas, Phineas in particular, both of them, they were, Phineas was not, he was living in sin and he was not ready to die. And I'm sure that Phineas' wife recognized that my husband's not ready to die. And that would make her grief greater mm -hmm. that he's living, he's been living in sin, he's not truly repentant, and now he's dying in his sin. And that must have made it even so much harder, you know, 
It's hard for parents to lose a child. It's hard for us to lose a loved one. But when we know that that person, their heart is right with the Lord, they've lived a life for the Lord, they've committed themselves to the Lord, we have hope that we'll be resurrected and we'll be together in heaven. But when there's someone that we love and we know that they're not living right with the Lord, we know that they are living in sin, and we recognize that God's not going to allow open sin into heaven, uh, that's, it's, it, it hurts so much more when someone dies that they're not ready to meet their maker. So her grief obviously would have been great, but he was even greater knowing that he was living in sin and died in sin. I would also say that, like, I absolutely understand how she's feeling and what she was experiencing and everything. But at the same time, I feel like she was holding on to it herself and tried to handle it herself when she should have surrendered it to the Lord and got his strength and his peace. And then she could have endured it. on our own we can't handle this kind of stuff that's right yeah. yes his strength is made perfect in our weakness with men this is impossible but with God all things are possible the head of a moth the head of a moth has eyes, antenna, and mouth parts. We will learn more about the eyes today. Moths have two large compound eyes, one on each side of the head. There are many separate lenses in each eye, which makes a complete picture of what is around the moth. This reminds us of God's ability to see everything that is going on in the world all at once. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Proverbs 15, verse 3. Compound eyes especially allow the moth to see movement, which could be an enemy approaching. Israel was spiritually blind. But when they, or Israel, looked upon the ark, they did not associate it with God nor honor his revealed will by obedience to his law. Israel did not see the sin in their lives that caused the enemy to take the ark. Eli, the leader, was blind spiritually as well as physically. Which it makes you wonder how him being the high priest, he could have gotten to that point. Like, I don't think it was just his sons being disobedient. I would think that there would have had to have been something prior to that or more that led to, like, each little step leading him further and further away. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the other thing that surprises me is Eli didn't say, Hophni and Phinehas, you can't do this, but nobody else did either. Like, nobody else came to him and said, hey, what's going on here is not right. Mm -hmm. Or at least we don't have biblical record of that. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely Samuel was given a message from the Lord to say, Eli, you're not restraining your, your sons mm -hmm. from doing this evil, and the Lord is going to judge your house. So... There, there could have been other people, but we do know for sure that the Lord spoke this message through the child Samuel. Well, in my mind, it would seem appropriate to me for someone to be like, this is the Lord's house and like this has to stop and like hold Eli accountable in some way. But maybe they didn't have that authority or I don't know. 
it would be a very hard situation to be in if you were a follower of God and you are wanting to worship at the temple and all this stuff and all these things are going on. Mm-hmm. Like, that would be so confusing. Yeah. Like, the priests are... The two main priests are taking advantage of sexual advantage and the women that are coming to bring an offering to the Lord or coming to worship or yeah it's um and it just makes me wonder like why was he so merciful with them but not others but the Lord knows the heart it's just I don't understand yeah uh, there's things that I don't understand about how the Lord may give one person years of mercy and opportunity for repentance and then others may not have as many years to repent. Um, However, we do know that the Lord gives everybody a fair chance. Mm -hmm. Uh, He gives everybody the opportunity to choose will they follow His way or will they live a life of sin. Will they travel on the highway of holiness or travel on the broad, easy, fun way that leads down to eternal death and destruction and hell? Each person can choose, will I be a child of light or a child of darkness? Will I be in the sheepfold within the boundaries of the fold and be in the sheepfold, or will I go over the wall or under the wall and go out on my own? Will Christ be my king, my king of kings and my lord of lords, or will I be my own God and do what I want to do? Well, the choice comes to each person, and God does give each person opportunity to choose. Will Will you choose life or will you choose death? So, I remember when we were reading about the mixed multitude when they left Egypt and how the ones that were not sorry for doing a graven image or were really firm in their beliefs and very against the Lord, they were taken out and it was because they would have taken more people astray with them Mm -hmm. but then in this situation it's kind of a similar thing that these these two men could have been taken out or taken out of their positions as high priests or not high priests but priests but they weren't and so I guess that would have been a test for the people or trial for them to go through and say like are you still going to serve me no matter what Mm mm-hmm so an extreme trial for mm-hmm. the people to go through. And people like Samuel mm-hmm. were able to endure it. Yes, and during that time when they were fornicating and dancing around the golden calf and having a big party and all the music, when Moses you know, came down from the mountain with Joshua, uh, they were confronted with you're doing wrong here and there was a line drawn and Moses said those that are on the Lord's side come here and so there was those who were had been committing sin and been, been involved in this horrible dishonor to God and to each other but they came they stepped over that line mm-hmm. in repentance they were forgiven. They chose, okay, well, we don't want to be part of this party anymore. This is going to lead to death. We do want to be on the Lord's side. We're sorry that we've done this. There was mercy in, for them, but for the people who were like, mm, I'm going to party on. No, I don't care what Moses said or what the Lord said. I'm going to do what feels good for me. And those were those people were destroyed. Um. One thing that we can remember is when Lucifer rebelled up in heaven, the Lord could have destroyed him right away. 
And some people say, oh, well, well, since Satan is the instigator of all of this misery and sin, well, God could have just mm -hmm. killed Lucifer and, and then, you know, we wouldn't be in this big miserable mess that we're in. Why didn't God deal with Lucifer, nip it in the bud? Mm -hmm. And that's a good question, and people wonder about this. Uh, can you can you love someone if you have no choice in the matter? And at the time when Lucifer rebelled, there was only God's way. There wasn't any other way to live. There wasn't any alternate kingdom. There was only one way to live, one kingdom, nothing else. But when Lucifer started rebelling, he started creating another kingdom, another way to live with another set of rules, or actually no rules. So you have Lucifer and his plan over here, and you have God and his plan over here. And so God could have just put Lucifer to death right away. But then the angels would not really know, like, was he really, did, did he have, was his kingdom really a destructive kingdom? Was it really mm -hmm. something that's not, not good? And they would have had a big question mark in their minds, and it would have been hard for them to love God and trust him. They may have been obedient because, oh, I don't want to get killed like Lucifer got killed, but they couldn't really truly trust their heavenly father and trust G jesus the son yeshua they couldn't really have a, a trust there and so our heavenly father in his wisdom allowed lucifer to go on and become satan and create his own kingdom and so you have satan's way and you have our heavenly father's way and you have these two different kingdoms and over time people could see that oh Satan's kingdom is very destructive. It leads to death. It's not a good plan. And they could see that the Heavenly Father's way was so, so perfect, and its laws were fair, and its laws were just. And so there's, there is a reason why God allowed Lucifer's sin and rebellion to go on like it did. And then later the, the angels were able to watch and see this innocent Son of God Jesus, Yeshua, who healed the blind and the sick and the lame and all he did all these these kind things, all these good things, and yet Satan is stirring up his followers to torture this innocent son of God and torture him and put him to death. That was Satan's goal all along to destroy the Son of God so he could take that place. Oh okay. Everything that our Heavenly Father told us about His plans, now we see His His real intentions come out, mm -hmm. and we have no question at all that, yes, everything we were told about where this was going, it's gone where we were told it was going to go. And so the angels can now serve their Heavenly Father, the, the loyal angels that stayed with Jesus and with the Father, they can see that, okay, we're, we're sure, we know without a shadow of a doubt that uh, everything we were told about his plans and what his intentions were have come to pass. And so there's this perfect trust that the angels have. So that is one reason why, uh, you know, and another thing is, is you can tell somebody, you, you can tell the child, don't touch the stove. The stove will burn you. Don't touch the stove. You can tell the child that. But they may not believe that. But if you give the child the freedom to touch the stove, ah, then you don't have to force them to obey you. Now they come to the logical conclusion that, oh, my daddy or my mommy, they knew that that was going to hurt me and they didn't want me to get hurt. And so they warned me not to do that. But I did that anyway. I'd better listen next time. Mm -hmm. And so the, our Heavenly Father gives, gives His children some freedom to go out and touch sin and realize, that, oh, sin burns me. Sin hurts me. 
I should have trusted that what my Heavenly Father warned me about that, but that sin's not good for me. As you work together as a family, use your eyes to honor God. For example, if you see your mother carrying a heavy load, rush to help her. Look to see if you have picked up your clothes and put them in the appropriate place. Psalm 101 and verse 3. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. This means to avoid looking at wrong magazines, in the grocery store checkout line, television, movies, anything that might pollute the mind and corrupt the morals. Let's look for moths and learn to identify them. Visit a blind person. Remember the lessons of how Israel was blind in not honoring God and how moths used the eyes to detect their enemy. Pray for God to anoint your eyes with eye salve that you can see. Like it says in Revelation 3.18. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom and before honor is humility. Proverbs 15 and verse 33. The scriptures state that Eli was an old man and heavy. One wonders if he indulged his appetite and perhaps transmitted his this tendency to Hophni and Phineas as they exhibited a lack of restraint in regard to eating. See 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verses 13 through 17. So, if a man is not exercising self-control in what he eats, and there's no power to say, no, I'm not going to eat that thing that's unhealthy for me. No, I'm not going to eat too much of this that would be damaging to my body. If there's a weakness on that point, then with the sexual appetites, there also will tend to be a lack of power to say, no, I'm not going to cross over that boundary and disobey the Lord and break the promises that I've made to my wife. And uh, there's that these are our appetites with what we eat and then the other appetites that we may have. Um, those two things, if we're weak on one, if we're weak on the point of appetite for food, it can lead to a weakness in other ways. So if you lack self-control in your diet, you're also going to lack self-control in other areas. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so it's clear that the Hophni and Phineas, they lack self-control in the area of their appetite with what they're eating and in their sexual appetites as well. They did not have self-control. One other thing is if you're sitting on the device all the time, you're going to be making mm -hmm. the limbic system in your brain bigger than the prefrontal cortex and mm -hmm. then you're also going to lack self-control because of actual physical changes to your brain. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, like watching something like this is not going to enlarge your limit system, but it's things like movies, video games, mm -hmm. things where the frame is like changing mm -hmm. every few seconds. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of stuff that grows your limbic system. And then, like the children that are on these devices, then they physically lack the ability to have self-control because it's um, 
problem in the physical makeup of her brain. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, when you watch television and um, movies, oftentimes you'll, you'll see a scene and we're supposed to be able to look at something and analyze it like, is this, is this good? Is this healthy? Is this safe? Is this going to hurt me? And we see in real life, we see different scenes and situations, but on a lot of TV programs and movies, you see this scene and you can't really, it happens so fast, you can't really analyze, is this safe? Is this pleasing to the Lord? Is this, and, and it, you can't really analyze it and and come to a conclusion that is what's going on here and it, it happens so fast and the scenes change so quickly frames are changing so quickly that you can't really focus and then when you're when you when your mind can't focus and analyze then it goes into this other kind of state where you're taking things in but you're not deciding you're, you're not making a good an analysis of it and you're not coming to your mind is in this different kind of state and I don't have all the terminology for it but when it comes into this state that is like a hypnotic mm -hmm. type of uh, brain pattern where you'll just take things in without making decisions on it Take it in as truth or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where Satan wants you to be. He doesn't want you to be making decisions based upon the wisdom that God gives you. He just wants you to take it all in. So he can just fill you up with his messages that can influence you. I never thought about that. About how basically all movies and videos where they're using this quick change frame mm -hmm. is actually a form of hypnosis. Mm -hmm. The devil had a vision and made television. Yeah. Uh, he knows how our mind functions better than we do. And he, he knows physiology. He knows how the body works, mm -hmm. how the brain works. And uh, he's been very successful in uh, putting his messages into our, the minds of Americans and people all, all over the world. It would be amazing to be able to truly like see everything that's going on mm -hmm. like outside of mm -hmm. this world and mm -hmm. to understand Mm -hmm. all the things that the devil is doing. We would be far more careful than we are if we could see Satan planning with his demons. And, mm -hmm. Hey, demon, uh, I see this young woman over here. Uh, here's your assignment. Um, get her hooked up with this young man that doesn't really love the Lord. Maybe he, he, he have him uh, appear... Get him in church enough to where he appears to be a good guy and get them hooked up together so that she can't fulfill the, the, the calling that God's put on her life. And, oh, demon, there's this uh, man over here. Um, and keep, uh, keep, keep leading him to destroy his lungs with tobacco so he can't live out the purpose that God created him for. And, oh, there's this... Um, demon here here's your assignment there's this man over here this uh, address over here and uh, he's he's not he's a young man he's not drinking alcohol yet but um, lead him to some people that will influence him to drink alcohol uh, so that he won't think clearly and he won't make good decisions and let's try to arrange things to where he gets drunk and he dies in a drunken wreck and if we could see Satan assigning these different demons to different tasks so that different people would be destroyed and their lives wrecked and messed up and shattered, 
we would be praying more, but like, Lord, please shield me and deliver me and, and uh, deliver my neighbors from this, these demonic assignments from being successfully carried out. Yeah, and if we could see, like, the demons whistling people's ear, like, oh, it's not going to hurt you, or, mm -hmm. oh, you should do this, then maybe God would be more aware. Yes. Yes. But Satan doesn't want us to be, so we need to be close to the Lord so that we can have discernment. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then we can hear the Lord's voice in our head saying, Honey, don't do that. That's not good for you. Yes. Yes. So we had the sanctuary. Inside the sanctuary, we had the ark with the law of God. And then the law of God is removed from the sanctuary. So there's no law in the sanctuary anymore. That was the worst thing that could happen to Israel. When you have this body is the sanctuary of the Lord. And when you have God's law written in your heart, in your heart and in your mind, you're able to be guided by your Heavenly Father. And you have safe boundaries for your life. The worst thing that can happen for you is if you let things slide and then somehow that moral compass is taken away from you. If somehow the law is taken out of your sanctuary and now you have no law anymore and it's gone, that's the worst thing that can befall you. May God continue to write his law into our mind and our hearts. And may he give us a willingness to obey that law. That law brings life. So I feel like having the law in your mind is like memorizing it. And then having it in your heart is obeying it. Yes. So it's not just enough to memorize it. We also have to follow it. Yes. Yes. It needs to go from our head to our heart. Yeah. Okay. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we see this sad story of how the law was taken away from the sanctuary. The light had gone out. The glory had departed. Please, Father, keep your law safely inside our sanctuary. Help us, Father, to hold on to this law that, you, that you're writing in our hearts and our minds, to not let it go, not allow somebody to just take the law out of our lives and then we're empty and then the glory is gone. Father, we want your law in our, in our hearts and our minds that your glory could shine out from us. Thank you, Father. We ask for our friends, our loved ones that have been demonically controlled that the demons have an assignment to destroy them. We ask for our friends and our loved ones and our family that you would interpose and intervene that Satan's plans would not be fulfilled and, but that your plans would be fulfilled in, the, in our lives and the lives of our friends and our family. We ask in the mighty name of your son Jesus, Yeshua. Amen.